Welcome to the Frontier AETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh and I'd like to turn it over to our speaker for the talk today. Thank you. So what I wanted to discuss today would be the role of vitamin D in particular in the HIV infected patients. So let's start with some brief background and introduction about vitamin D synthesis and metabolism. So vitamin D3 is synthesized in the skin from an exposure to sunlight, the UVB rays, from the cholesterol precursors in the skin, the 17 dehydro cholesterol, and that's the pro D3 hormone that gets con converted to vitamin D3. Now, there are also dietary sources of vitamin D3, which comes fortified in milk and orange juice and naturally present in salmon and some oily fatty fish. Now, uh, both vitamin D2 and, vi D again, vitamin D2 comes from some dietary sources as well and uh, supplements. Now, both vitamin D2 and D3 are biologically inert and need to be hydroxylated. So they first get hydroxylated in the liver by the 25-hydroxylase enzyme and get converted to 25-hydroxyvitamin D. That's the major circulating source of vitamin D. Now it has to again undergo an active hydroxylation by 1-alpha-hydroxylase in the kidneys to become the active form, that's the 125 dihydrovitamin D, and that's the major or the biologically active form of vitamin D. Now, the 125 hydroxyvitamin D work, I mean, we, the vitamin D receptors are found in several tissues, I mean, most of the tissues in the body, but they, in the intestines, what they do is it increases the calcium and phosphorus absorption. In the bones, they mobilize the calcium stores by converting to mature osteoclasts, and then in the kidneys, they also help in reabsorption of calcium in the glomerular filtrate. So the vitamin D helps in maintaining the serum calcium and phosphorus. Now, again, when we look at the functions of vitamin D, apart from the role of 125-dihydroxyvitamin D in the muscle and bone health, they have pleiotrophic effects on nearly 200 genes in the body and help in regulation of blood pressure, cardiovascular health, neurodevelopment. It's taught to work on the monocytes and macrophages and help have an immunomodulatory effect, preventing autoimmune diseases and controlling invading pathogens. Again, it's taught to have a role in regulation of the cell growth and differentiation in a number of tissues in the body. So let's go to look at some of the definitions. Now, the, we measure or we assess vitamin D in the body by measuring the circulating form of vitamin D, that's the 25-hydroxyvitamin D. The Institute of Medicine in 2011 came up with their guidelines, which defines vitamin D deficiency when 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels are less than 20 nanograms per ml and the vitamin D insufficiency is when the levels are between 21 to 29 nanograms per ml based on the level of suppression of the PTH. But most of the organizations, osteoporosis organizations like the National Osteoporosis Foundation, the International Osteoporosis Foundation, the American Geriatric Association, all favor a minimum level of 30 nanograms per ml for skeletal health. So the consensus in most of the bone clinics for skeletal health would be 30 nanograms per ml. Now the optimum level for extraskeletal health has not been established. Now based on these definitions, the prevalence of vitamin D from an enhanced 2006 survey showed nearly 41.6% of adults had 25 vitamin D levels less than 20 nanograms per ml. And this, the, uh, the problem of vitamin D deficiency is a global phenomenon, not only in the temperate areas, but also in areas where there is a lot of sun, like in Australia, Middle East, India, Africa, and South America. And that's because darker skin tones are very sun protective, so they need four to five times increased exposure to sun to synthesize vitamin D. And with clothing, increased use of sunscreens, the vitamin D deficiency is prevalent even in warm and hot climates. Now, if we look at the prevalence of vitamin D in HIV-infected individuals, the range 
from several small to moderate studies could be as much as 70 to 83 percent. And there are several risk factors for vitamin D deficiency in HIV-infected individuals in addition to the traditional risk factors. So the traditional risk factors are, again, older individuals, obesity, darker skin tone, using sunscreens, in, you know, protective clothing, in other words, inadequate sun exposure. But in addition to these traditional risk factors, HIV-infected individuals have malnutrition with a reduced intake of fortified food. They have malabsorption and have frequent hospitalizations that would prevent them from having sun exposure from infections and complications. Now, HIV infection per se from the chronic inflammation increases or there's an increase or overproduction of TNF-alpha, which then reduces the 1-alpha hydroxylation and redu reduces the PTH to form active 125-hydroxyvitamin D. Now, the effects of antiretroviral therapy is also profound and has been studied in several human trials. And the most significant group of antiretroviral agents that have an impact on vitamin D levels would be, one would be the protease inhibitors, ritonavir or dano, danovir. Um, it inhibits the 1-alpha and the 25-alpha hydroxylation. So there's a reduction in the production of both 25-hydroxy vitamin D and then the reduction in the conversion of 25-hydroxy vitamin D to the active form. Now, the NNRTIs, are like the efavirenz, reduces the expression of the cytochrome P450 enzyme, which is involved in the conversion of vitamin D3, again, to 25-hydroxy vitamin D. It also upregulates the CYP24, which converts the active vitamin D to inactive metabolites. So again, there is both these eight group of agents reduce the formation of vitamin D. And in fact, human trials have shown reduction of 25 hydroxy vitamin D with the NNRTIs when they get started by as much as 6 to 10 nanograms per ml. Now, the other group is the tenofovir, which has impact significantly on the bones by increasing the PTH. It's thought to be the proximal tubular effect, but it also elevates the vitamin D binding protein, thereby reducing the free 125 dihydroxy vitamin D levels. So there's like a functional state of vitamin D deficiency that happens when patients get initiated on this agent. So what are the consequences of vitamin D deficiencies? There is decrease in the intestinal calcium and phosphorus absorption of dietary calcium and phosphorus. So when there is vitamin D deficiency, only about 10 to 15 percent of dietary calcium, as opposed to 30 to 40 percent of calcium gets absorbed. And with the phosphorus, again, only 60 percent dietary phosphorus is absorbed, as opposed to 80 percent of phosphorus when one is repleted with vitamin D. Now, again, low vitamin D triggers a compensatory increase in parathyroid hormone. So there's a secondary hyperparathyroidism that mobilizes the calcium from the bones and increases the osteoclastic activity with low bone density. Now, there's a phosphaturia or increased urinary phosphorus excretion from the secondary hyperparathyroidism leading to low normal levels of phosphorus. And so there is inadequate calcium and phosphorus production with defective mineralization of the skeleton. So these are the clinical manifestations of the vitamin D deficiency. Mild vitamin D deficiency may be asymptomatic. Severe vitamin D deficiency, when it's less than 10 nanograms per ml when prolonged, can lead to osteomalacia with bony pain, tenderness, proximal muscle weakness, diffuse muscle pain, recurrent falls, and fractures. So in these patients with severe vitamin D deficiency, it's important to do a basic metabolic panel, alkaline phosphatase, PTH, and also look for any malabsorption issues like celiac disease. Now, when we come to screening, screening for general population is not recommended, but it's recommended in individuals at a risk for deficiency. So HIV patients on antiretroviral therapy, HIV-infected patients with low bone density, osteoporosis, or fragility fractures, should have vitamin D levels checked. And these are the recommended daily vitamin D intake, and I've kind of split this up to what the Institute of Medicine agrees on as their daily requirements and what the Endocrine Society recommends as the daily requirements and the upper limits, and you can see there is a big difference, but that's because most of the studies which are looking at skeletal health 
look at the supplementation anywhere between 1,000 to 2,000 IUs a day of vitamin D. So let's go to what to do for treating vitamin D deficiency. So all adults with vitamin D deficiency can be treated with age of 50,000 IUs of vitamin D2 or D3 once a week for eight weeks. And then they're followed with a maintenance of 1,500 to 2,000 IUs per day of vitamin D3. Now you can use both vitamin D2 or D3. That's the D2 is the ergocalciferol and the D3 is the polycalciferol. Now, historically and conventionally, D2 is used, ergocalciferol, because there are multiple manufacturers which make that 50,000 units pull. For vitamin D3 to get these high strengths, you have to go more to specialty pharmacies not covered by the insurance and patients have to pay much out of the pocket. But I always prefer maintenance dose to be vitamin D3, which is available over the counter. Again, obese patients and those who are on antiretroviral therapy may need more than two to three times higher dose of vitamin D for uh, treating their vitamin D deficiency. Um, liquid forms are available. Iron forms are not available right now. Extremely painful. Again, 25-hydroxyvitamin D is the best indicator to monitor the status. Typically, after they are repleted a month or at the end of the repletion, they should have their 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels tested. If they still have not reached 30 nanograms and they're very close between 20 to 30, you can repeat another six weeks. But if they are still very low and you're very convinced that the patient is compliant, then you may want to look for malabsorption syndromes and give really super high doses probably 50,000 units two or three times a week. I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go to this next slide, which is about a study that I want to draw your attention on vitamin D and calcium supplementation on initiation of antiretroviral therapy to attenuate bone loss. So this is a recent study in the annals, and I'm sure it's worth a read. Now, there's about 2 to 6% of bone loss on initiation of antiretroviral therapy, especially the ones with tenofovir and FR. So what this study looks at is evaluating the effect of vitamin D3 plus calcium supplementation on bone loss on initiating these therapies. So there were 79 adults who received 4,000 IUs of vitamin D3 and about 500 milligrams of calcium carbonate twice a day. And 86 of them received the placebo at the start of the antiretroviral therapy of the atropine. Now, supplementation with high-dose vitamin D3 increased the 25D levels by a median of about 28.6 nanograms per ml. You can see that graph showing the dotted lines of the, the placebo where they are and the levels reached when they're treated with vitamin D and calcium. Now, the bone density, there was a small decrease in bone density in both the groups, but you can see that the rate of decline in the bone density, both in the hip and in the spine is far lesser with the vitamin D and the calcium supplementation. So in fact, it's like 50% more bone loss on the placebo when compared to the vitamin D and calcium supplementation group. So what this really shows is thinking about using high dose vitamin D3 with calcium supplementation that can be used to mitigate the bone loss when this treatment is initiated. Again, this study also looked if the vitamin D could affect the inflammatory changes and have any immunomodulatory effect, but I don't think it was designed to look at those effects. Now, most of the studies and what we talk about is looking at the skeletal health of vitamin D in HIV-infected patients. Now, there are very few and far between studies looking at extraskeletal health in the cardiovascular outcomes with vitamin D deficiency. Now, again, there is no studies looking at supplementing vitamin D and improving the levels and looking at cardiovascular outcomes. So at this moment, I think we would talk more about the benefits of vitamin D on skeletal health. So I want to leave you with some take-home points. There is an increased prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in HIV-infected patients from malnutrition, malabsorption, and certain antiretroviral therapy. Now, screening is recommended in individuals at risk for deficiency. The HIV-infected patients on antiretroviral therapy, HIV-infected patients with low bone density, osteoporosis, and fragility fracture. Most organizations favor 25-hydroxyvitamin D levels more than 30 nanograms per ml for optimal skeletal health. All adults who are vitamin D deficient should be treated either with 50,000 IUs of vitamin D2 or D3 once a week for eight weeks. 
followed by a maintenance dose of 1,500 to 2,000 IU daily of vitamin D3. And there was a recent study that's shown that vitamin D3 plus calcium supplementation can mitigate the bone loss seen on initiation of the A3. Thank you.